Welcome everybody to Go Local Live. I'm Josh Fenton, CEO and co-founder of Go Local. Joining me as he has every day at noon, Dr. Michael Fine, former head of the Rhode Island Department of Health. Uh, Dr. Fine, thank you so much for joining us again today. A lot has taken place just in the last 24 hours. Let's start with the numbers. Great. Um, first, I always like to start with the notion that 89,000 people around the world have had this disease and recovered. And that's 89,000 tested people. We think there are many, many thousands of other people who had an apparent or mild disease who we're not hearing about at all. I said yesterday I was going to talk about the number of people in ICUs in the United States. I have to give that up because it looks like the data flow I was relying on looks like it's not adequate. Um, we have 255,000 people around the world who have been tested and positive, but again, many thousands of others, likely many millions of others, have the disease, have mild disease, and are recovering from it. Um, the rate of rise of new cases has slowed a little bit around the world, though the rate of rise of new cases in the United States continues to be pretty robust. We have about 14,372 cases uh, in the United States. Uh, remember, that's tested cases. We probably have many thousands of others. 217 deaths, unfortunately, in the United States. And as of yesterday, we had 44 cases in Rhode Island with a increased day over day of about 11. Um, what are you seeing from a standpoint, let's focus in on the United States. Uh, we've seen most of the deaths come out of the state of Washington. Almost all of them, not quite all of them, but many of them tied to one nursing home. That's certainly an interesting data point. Um, uh, secondly, we're seeing in the two most populated states, uh, New York and in California, uh, governors taking very significant action uh, in deep concern about what might take place in the near future. That's, that's not a shock um, given the density of population. You know, sort of logically, the opposite of social distancing is population density. So places that are incredibly densely populated likely to have more disease. That means in Rhode Island, we need to think about Central Falls and Providence and Cranston um, as places where disease is likely to be spreading, even though we may not be seeing it as such. Um, you have been banging the drum probably more vigorously than anyone else on the issue of the critical need in the state of Rhode Island of identifying and expanding the number of ICU units as well as the number of ventilators. Do you want to talk about that? Well, I think it continues to be critical to what we're trying to do. Remember, we're trying to reduce the uh, rate of rise. We're trying to, you know, sort of reduce the height of the curve, as we say, reduce the number of new cases coming at the ICU because it's the ICU that we really need to care for the sick sickest patients. Our problem is that the, the our approach to social distancing, um, which is a we think helpful, but it's still, it's still unknown whether our approach will be effective as the Chinese approach because the Chinese approach was fundamentally different. Remember, the Chinese used uh, isolation hospitals, um, moving people out of their own homes into isolation hospitals until they recovered, and they brought in thousands of other health workers uh, to make sure this happened. We don't have the capacity to bring in those thousands of other people and we haven't yet seen uh, the construction of isolation units or isolation hospitals, which would be part of that response. So it's likely that the social distancing is helping some, but it's doubtful that it's helping as much as uh, it helped in China, which means we got to be prepared uh, for a bolus of people who need the ICU, and we need to have enough beds and ventilators to take care of them. Um, the, do that now. the Italian uh, physician, uh, Marcello 
uh, Natali uh, set off a viral video about a week ago discussing the shortage of basic health care uh, safety equipment for first line workers, uh, specifically in the case uh, that he was talking about was just basic gloves. Uh, he has passed away now from the coronavirus. Uh, governors around the country are hitting the same sort of warning issue as well as uh, frontline uh, emergency room and other physicians around the country. Uh, how in America, you know, when I was a kid, if you can send a man to the moon, you ought to be able to X, Y, or Z. How is it that we can build electric cars as fast as we need to or transform what seems to be leveraging technology to do most any task? We can't manufacture basic, most basic items at a sufficient level and get them to where they need to be. My, gu my guess is we can, we just haven't. That, it, you know, we, we switched over to just-in-time supply, you know, probably 20 years ago. The good news about just-in-time supply is it's very efficient. The bad news is it doesn't create a strategic stockpile, which is what we need now. The real underlying issue is our willingness to sort of forget about public health until there's an epidemic. You know, we should have been doing this a long time ago. As far as, you know, I've been thinking a little bit about every time we, we build a new hotel, we ought to give that hotel some public money and let them put in a, a little oxygen piping and vacuum tubing so that we could switch over and use hotels as hospitals or isolation wards if we need to. We've not thought about anything like that. And that's kind of, you know, now we're being caught kind of with our pants down because we haven't done the kind of investment in public health um, that we should have been doing all along. Uh, the state is looking at facilities like the University of Rhode Island, its athletic facilities, its dormitories, the Rhode Island Convention Center as potential uh, facilities to be used uh, to expand the capacity of, uh, of Rhode Island's health care network. Uh, are we moving fast enough and are those the right f types of facilities to be able to address what we're going to need in 30, 45 days? You know, I, I think they are the right kind of facilities to be isolation hospitals. Um, we haven't started talking about isol isolation hospitals publicly very much yet, and we probably need to do that so people are prepared and prepared for a world in which if you get sick, you get tested. Uh, if you test positive, you get moved out of your house into an isolation facility. I think that may be coming, but they are not the right facilities not the right places to do, uh, to run ventilators as intensive care units. And that's what I'm, I'm concerned about. And I'm concerned about the speed at which we are building that intensive unit capacity. You know, we're going to have to marshal all our resources, you know, redeploy people who are doctors and nurses who have been doing other things, quickly retrain people. And that's what I'm not seeing with anywhere near as much intensity, at least you know, where I'm, I'm not hearing about it publicly, um, I'd love to see much more focus on that kind of a Marshall Plan, uh, you know, an emergency sort of uh, wartime scenario for how we pull all our resources to get together and get them focused on that single one thing, the number of ICU beds available. Um, orthopedic surgeons aren't probably going to be doing a lot of uh, surgery in the next uh, few months. Should they, as well as everyone else who is a licensed physician in the state of Rhode Island, should we be calling back retired physicians, retired nurses, and build as big a workforce for the next 90, 120, 180 days? Yeah, I, I, th I think we need to be studying our workforce quickly, um, beginning to train my orthopedic colleagues, my primary care colleagues, you know, and others to run ventilators to help in ICUs, to do everything we can so we are ready for this onslaught. You know, our, uh, our emergency department colleagues and our ICU colleagues, our, our pulmonolo pulmonologist colleagues are way better at this than most of us, um, but one would hope we are trainable, um, but we have to be organized and that's where we need organization and command and control. Um, what, what's your biggest watchword for Rhode Islanders today? What should they be thinking about? What should they be doing? 
I think what people should be doing is preparing to be sick. I don't mean to be, you know, this is not, people aren't going to get very sick by and large. People are going to get a little sick, but will need to isolate themselves. So that means making sure you have a thermometer at home and know how to use it. Making sure that you have Tylenol or acetaminophen um, and know how to use it. Making sure you have fluids. I like the idea of designating a room in your house as a hibernation room if you can do that um, so that if one person in the household gets ill, they can move in there and don't get exposed to, to people uh, elsewhere. So that's one sort of uh, kind of things people should be doing. People should also be thinking about how to use health care judiciously now. Our new instruction, our new suggestion is that if you get sick with mild illness, regardless of what it's caused, you go into hibernation for seven days at least. Um, you find a place to, to be quiet. You don't circulate. You take Tylenol for low-grade temperature if you need to. You drink a lot of fluids. You rest in bed. Um, and you call for help if you need it, but you don't need to call for help if you're feeling basically okay. Um, and, and then understand that when you call for medical assistance, you are likely, likely now to be taken care of over the phone in the first instance. Don't be disappointed if you don't have a, a doctor or nurse practitioner PA who actually sees you. Just let's get you taken care of over the phone. And, and then you need to understand what triggers the need for more advanced care. And those things are actually pretty straightforward and pretty simple. A high fever for more than two days in a row, um, any significant shortness of breath, um, or the inability to take fluids and uh, becoming somewhat dehydrated. Those are the things that might say we need hospital care. Short of that, stay home, rest in bed, Break fluids on your own, take your own temperature. We can do this. You know, this is something that, you know, normal American adults can manage. Um, and if you can manage on your own, please try to do that. I'm going to leave the state's economy or the national economy or the global economy to the side. How long can a society, from your standpoint, what you've seen, what you know of, be in this isolated, distance society? Uh, without breaking apart to some degree. Can we do this for three months, six months? Josh, I think that's the open question. You know, that's why it's so important for us to take care of everybody, to make sure that every single person has what they need. Because for young people in particular, the calculus is going to change if we don't have access to food and shelter. And that calculus is going to say, well, if I need food and I can't get it any other way, I need to go out in the street and work or do something else. Um, you know, and it's more dangerous to me and my family if I don't get food than it is for me to go out because, in fact, for most of us, it's not very dangerous to get this disease. But it is very dangerous for those people to spread it. And that's going to be the tension. The challenge has to be maintaining our supply and maintaining people's sense that economically they're going to be okay so that they can stay home as we need them to and so that they get ready if they get sick to move into an isolation hospital and we don't get you know sort of social instability when we start saying to people we're going to move you to an isolation hospital for a couple of weeks you know for a week or two till you get better that shouldn't upset you those are the things that might drive social instability, it seems to me. And those are the things we need to start talking about and making sure that everybody has what they need. Food, shelter, electricity, hot water, you know, the basics of, of life so that people feel like they can continue and continue, can continue uh, with security. Uh, Dr. Fine, any other last words you want to uh, uh, partake? Uh, to Rhode Island uh, before we hit the weekend? And just, you know, just remember, this is a mild disease. Most of us are going to get it. We're all going to do fine. Rhode Island is doing better than any place I know at approaching this responsibly in an organized manner. And we're doing great as a community. We need to keep watching out for each other. 
um, and that's what's going to get us through this. Hopefully, we'll be done in a couple of months, and then we can celebrate that uh, our ability to, to go out and be together again. We are a feisty lot. We took on the biggest uh, empire in the world back in, uh, I think, uh, 1771. Uh, when we torch that schooner Gatsby, those thoughts shouldn't be lost. We can take them on, we can take this on. Uh, a little programming note, one o'clock, Governor Raimondo uh, back uh, with reporters for a briefing. I believe the president was just on a few minutes ago. And at three o'clock today, we're gonna be talking with Josh Short over at Wilbury Theater about a new initiative that Go Local is working on to support the arts and specifically Wilbury uh, to be able to uh, broadcast, live stream their performances uh, free of charge, hopefully generating some donations to them to be able to push out to the Rhode Island community. That we'll talk about at three o'clock. The first performance is gonna be Sunday night at 7 p.m. Dr. Fine, thank you again for joining us and we will talk soon, I'm sure. Thanks, Josh. Thank you.